Welcome back. And we're now doing panel two, which is unlocking investment. Does Europe have the right finance and support instruments? Or rather, does Europe have the right support and finance, finance instruments? We've talked briefly already about uh, price and availability in the first panel, but this one is really getting into the nitty gritty of how to finance the renewable hydrogen economy and also what it takes to get from the project and technology stage to actually having an industrial world leader. So we're going to try and fix all of this in the next 40 minutes. Uh, as we've already identified, some of the bottlenecks uh, uh, around the finance and the cost side seem to be the price of renewable electricity. At the moment, we get the sense that as a result, that there's not enough of it. Uh, and what there is, is it costs a bit more, which means that the price of green hydrogen compared to uh, Grey hydrogen, as we heard from Ignacio Galan earlier, is already a price gap of about four times. So this is quite a big thing. And the question is, how do we get that price down and get the costs, uh, economies of scale needed to build that industry in a sustainable way? So to help make sense of all of this, um, I'm very pleased to welcome our guests. Our first one, we have Vitea Cowan, and she is the co-founder of Anapta, the, an electrolyzer firm. And we also have Paulina Brzezinska, who is the advisor on innovation finance at the European Investment Bank. Uh, we have Dr. Christian Hartel, who is the chief executive of Waka Sherry, which is a chemical company, which is one of the end users, I guess, uh, of, of hydrogen in all its forms. Uh, we have Karina Krastel, who is the commercial director of... EGHAC, which is the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Centre. And she, for those of you who don't know it, she'll tell us a little bit more about its work later on. And then we also have Sopna Suri, who is the Chief Executive of Hydrogen, or the Hydrogen Unit of RWE Generation. And as I understand it, Sopna, this was a new unit that was created at the end of last year to help really take advantage and grow the uh, renewables and hydrogen uh, aspect of the business. And I'm actually going to start with you, Sopna. Um, while we have you there. So we've heard a little bit already in our first panel about the soaring gas prices and the cost of fossil fuels in general. But I have a more specific question as well. The EU emissions trading system, or the ETS, in the last few months, we've seen the price for carbon soar to unprecedented levels over the past few months, which is presumably a reflection also of the gas, you know, the prices of fossil fuels around the world. From your perspective, is this price increase enough to make renewable hydrogen competitive with grey and blue hydrogen? Yeah, thanks, Laura, for the question. I mean, as a matter of fact, I think we've been partly all caught by surprise of the railing we've been seeing this due to prices. But I think, as you already pointed out, looking at the wider, let me call it, political frame and society's zeitgeist, I think it's rather the necessary next logical step. However, to be very clear, I mean, the CO2 prices, even if they were well above 100 euros per tonne CO2, they're not going to be sufficient to really unlock a hydrogen economy. The reason simply laying in the, let me call it, um, abatement costs different sectors have, and you would always compare what is the lowest cost option, um, be it either grey hydrogen or other fossil resources. So from this perspective, I would say, of course, CO2 prices have to raise, but it's not going to be sufficient. And what we will be all looking for are the right regulatory and political conditions to then really support and make those cases competitive. So what would that really be? I think um, from our perspective, surely it's the topic also, and let's be very clear about it, public funding and support. We are not having any kind of commercially viable projects yet on the hydrogen sphere. So we'll be all in the markets relying heavily, be it on the EU innovation um, tender support schemes or on the IPSA that's called the important projects of common European interest. And I think those two are very good funding mechanisms to making sure companies and project developers are very clear what they need, but I think also in a partnership type of arrangement, charting out with public funding, what it takes to really make the business case fly. But even then funding won't be enough. And I think it will be very important also to understand if you talk about hydrogen, particularly green hydrogen, as the only really long-term sustainable hydrogen color, we'll need massive volumes of green power. And green electricity, I mean, we might like it or we might not like it, but as a matter of fact, it's a scarce resource, particularly in Germany, but also mar other markets in Europe. I mean, we are really short. The availability of actual area and acreage, be it on the seaside or even on land, is rather limited. So we'll never be able to really cover all our needs by green um, the renewables only. However, this then also means it's even more important to be very pragmatic 
and to making sure to unlock those business cases that we really tap into the full potential which is available. And here I concretely mean to also allow not only new additional assets to be qualified to kind of provide a green power to an electrolyzer, but also to using existing renewables assets, be it wind or PV, in whatever market, to making sure they can also support. Yeah, I think so. That's the second point: public funding, pragmatic definition of um, green power. And here, I think let's be all very clear. I think nation states, particularly Germany, has been doing a lot already, right, to be very supportive and pushing things forward. However, the game, the game is now being really judged in Brussels. So I think it's all our responsibility to making sure we kind of jointly as Europe look at it and making sure we don't lose our competitive advantage here. Yeah, and then I would say thank that you. Oh, about that's infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, very briefly, if you would just thank you. Yeah, the, the infrastructure bit is I think um, without any transport of the hydrogen, we are not going to make the business cases fly either. And I think that's also maybe sometimes a little bit of an overlooked point here. Um, but let's be confident. I think we can solve it together. Thank you very much. Now, um, Vaitea and Christian, I saw you both nodding at the point about green power and the fact that we just don't have enough green uh, um, affordable electricity available. Uh, sort of from the end user or not potentially the end user, but the user side of it. Do you think then that the ambitious end use targets for renewable and hydrogen will be enough to create that demand shock that the institutions here in Brussels are clearly hoping for? And if not, what finance and support instruments do you want to see uh, to help bridge the cost gap and make hydrogen more competitive? And Christian, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Laura. Yes, indeed, I was I was nodding what, what Sopna was saying. I think the biggest challenge we have today is that we have a lack of uh, green electricity available for the for that transformation. So, to, uh, but to answer your question, um, Laura, uh, the answer is definitely that is not enough. I mean, I, I do like, I personally do like ambitious targets because, you know, it, it gives, it energizes an organization and it helps you to, to achieve your goals maybe a little earlier. But um, the thing is, with the climate change we are facing, we don't have much time. So we need a real concrete action plan in order to transform the industry, but also the whole, the whole society. And I think the only question, the only thing what really helps is that we would have ample green electricity at a very competitive price. The demand today is already here. I mean, you have already the chemical industry with millions of tons of hydrogen used today, uh, which could be converted to green hydrogen. And, and also I would like to add that the chemical industry, in my view, plays an essential role in the transformation because the chemical industry is able to use carbon dioxide as a raw material. And I think that is a extremely positive message. Um, so what's the, you know, what's the challenge on it? The challenge is we use processes in the industry, in automotive, going, you know, from left to right, burning carbon, producing CO2, and by this producing energy. And this energy was the driving force of these reactions. Now, if you want to use CO2 and, and use it as a raw material, you just, it, it's upside down that reaction. Now, the positive message is that works. The challenge is you need more energy than the other way around. So, and this energy, of course, the equation only works if it is renewable without CO2. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that is something that is completely underestimated on the demand side of how much green electricity or energy we need. And the second part in using CO2 is is the molecule we talked today about is hydrogen. You need hydrogen to make something out of CO2. And again, the equation only works if you have ultimately the green hydrogen, which is produced with green electricity. So mm -hmm. what we demand from, from politicians in both in the country, but also in, in the European Union, is to, to really make an action plan for a massive buildup of green electricity. And of course, having the right infrastructure for the grids and having infrastructure for green hydrogen. Vaitea. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. I can only echo your comment on uh, the cost of electricity having to be attractive. Um, we welcome the EU thinking about uh, getting green hydrogen cheap. So, you know, end use demand targets are good. It's going in the right direction. However, if we only set 
these end use demand targets, then we're only driving down the capital expenditures, the CapEx, but not the operational expenditure, which is the OPEX. And this measure alone is not sufficient to have green hydrogen cost competitive with fossil fuels. So in order to make green hydrogen cheap, you need two things. The first one is the low CapEx. At Enaptor, this is our mission, which we will fulfill with our unique technology, the anion exchange membrane electrolyzer. So we can bring down the cost of our electrolyzers on our own, not through regulation. These cost reductions come from mass production. So lowering the capex is an after's responsibility, and it is our promise. Now, the second thing that we need to have um, green hydrogen being cheap is the low opex, the cost of electricity. And only new policies can make the cost of electricity cheap because it's not the cost of solar today that's holding back uh, hydrogen from being cost effective. So what we need is um, instruments. There are instruments to lower the cost of the OPEX and any instruments um, making the use of renewables cheaper to power electrolyzers are good. So policy instruments need to focus on making the inputs, the green electricity, cheaper. It's in the hand of policymakers to lower the cost of electricity at an after we will prompt, we will fulfill our promise to delivering the most cost effective electrolyzers. Thank you. Sopna, I saw you nodding all the way through that as well. Would you like to come back in on that at all? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think um, many right things already said, maybe on the ambition and whether it's really big enough. To be honest, I would be a bit more provocative in saying, I don't think we are ambitious yet. Yeah, I think, especially in Germany, which is about five gigawatts by 2030, looking at all the different users, also like, um, I mean, Wacker Chemie is one of those potential industry sectors, we need much more. So we could rather look about an electrolyzer capacity target of 10 gigawatts. And I think that would still be not sufficient, but I think also that this would give a vision also to other colleagues like the OEMs on the actual electrolysis part, because then they would actually understand the demand is there. If we have a target, we can get the right instruments. And I think the point about instruments for supporting lowering the cost of green electricity Yes, that would be really helpful, but I think especially in combination with the hydrogen production. So there are elements such as potentially combining and tenders, the build out of offshore electrolysis, um, where you could also use offshore wind. And there, I think you actually then meet both objectives, green power and additional green hydrogen capacity. Thank you very much. Okay, Christian, I'm going to bring you back in on that and perhaps you could react to what Sopna said, but I'm also going to ask you beyond availability of more green electricity, what other concrete measures do companies such as Wakakemi need to make that full switch to, re to renewable hydrogen and deeply decarbonize, mm -hmm. which I think means what, 80% or more? of your yeah. processes yeah as, you know as, as Wacker and, and many other companies in the, mm. in the company industry uh, we are really ready for the transformation but of course these are a lot of investments for us to 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 take within the next decade therefore what we really need and we have the technology like like what what Sopna and Vita said the technology is already here um, but we need a framework uh, where we can have a good planning on it and and one of these framework parts for me, would be a kind of guaranteed competitive electricity price for green energy, you know, without having huge fluctuations that your maybe your 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 you know the profitability of the whole project is uh, at scrutiny with, within a year of, of of building it up, and and what we believe what could be an option that would work pretty fine, I think, would be contracts for difference on the electricity because ultimately. You know, I have no doubt that, you know, in the 30s, you know, 2030 or 2035, there will be ample of green electricity at a very competitive price. Um, and right here, I also mentioned it. It's not the cost of producing green electricity is really not a problem. It is it is a valuable. The technology is there. So the idea would be you make a contract for difference, let's say, for a power price of four cents per kilowatt hour, which which holds through for the next decade. So in the next years, probably electricity prices will be higher than the four cent. So the EU, for example, could in a way subsidize this. But after a couple of years, the price will be below four euros for four cents per kilowatt hour. And then the companies would pay back that difference. So that's mm -hmm. the 
contract for difference idea. And I think that would really be a, a turbo for the transformation because it would give that signal to the industry. You can plan with a competitive price uh, and invest for, make your investments for, for uh, the transformation to carbon neutrality. Thank you very much. Okay, so that sort of brings us to the end of the first round. Don't forget, as an audio, if you're in the audience and you want to ask a question, please pose it via the Q and A uh, chat, and ideally tell us who it's for, um, or we will assign them if if we don't get that. But thank you for posting your questions. It's great to have them coming in. Okay, so let's talk specifically about project financing. Vaitea, before I bring in um, Karina and Paulina, I just want to sort of get a bit of a perspective from you about project financing and the sort of availability and the ease of accessing funds, particularly for smaller companies and startups. How challenging is it for them to get available funding? And what do you think should be changed to help the newcomers in this area? Thank you, Laura, for this question. Um, I do want to start off with a disclaimer. Uh, we are not talking here about the financial situation of an after. And I also couldn't help but want to reframe this question to address new technologies and not just smaller uh, companies. So in general, um, R&D funding is accessible. There are mechanisms today that are there, but they're only focusing on identifying and coming up with the innovation. So then what happens once the innovation is developed? This is where there's a gap. So innovations will only contribute to climate change if they are brought to scale. Otherwise, they're not gonna make an impact. So when developing a new technology, a company has no access to banks or loans, and because of their small operative numbers, they're deemed unbankable. So what we need is support for these new technologies in bringing innovations to scale. Not from R&D, but from R&D to scaling up the production. That's where the support is needed. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also the classic thing, isn't it, is that Europe's very good at doing projects, but not great at doing scale. And I'm mm -hmm. going to put this question, and this is perhaps something that Karina and Paulina can help us with too. But Paulina, um, what finance gaps have you detected um, in the green hydrogen business model, if you want to call it that, at the EIB? And, you know, base, you know, reacting to what Vizhaya and the others have said, what funding is currently available? And what requirements do you actually have to make those projects bankable? So a lot of things for you to think a about. Lot of questions. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really good that we brought up the, the question of scale um, because this is really the key challenge here. So we are looking at EU ambitions of really several hundreds of billions of euros um, in investment needed already in the next decade. And, you know, even with estimates going to 500 billion by 2050, so to really enable the hydrogen economy, what we need is to build gigawatt factories and huge, huge, huge projects with large financing requirements. And the European Investment Bank is already a key player in financing renewables. And we have very ambitious goals, including supporting 1 trillion uh, euros in projects in the next decade to support climate action and mitigation. Now, hydrogen, of course, will play a key role in this. Um, and we do, in fact, notice a lot of funding gaps and issues surrounding those types of large scale projects. So to bring the cost of hydrogen down, we're not only looking at cheap energy. There are also two more aspects. So one of them is economies of scale. And when building those large gigawatt factories and large projects, we can already bring the cost down. The second thing is also innovation and funding, R&D funding to new technologies that can develop new ways of hydrogen production or cheaper ways of hydrogen production. So two things here, really, from a financing perspective, the, the early stage innovation and then the late stage, large, large scale projects. Now, when we look at these large scale projects, we have um, a lot of risks that investors perceive and project promoters do have issues uh, securing funding. So the first issue, of course, is the large capital requirement that simply not all banks or all investors are able to provide. Um, the second issue is the long-term horizon of these kinds of projects. So we're really looking at horizons of 20 to 30 years when investors often seek short-term returns, like in, in the five to 10-year horizon. So there's, let's say, an up to 20 years gap 
that needs to be bridged. Um, other issues linked to project finance include um, the unstable offtake price. So when when project financiers um, engage in 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 in, um, in projects, they need to already sign contracts for the hydrogen to be bought once the factory is built. Now the price for that is obviously fluctuating and depending on regulation, depending on um, the, the price of natural gas. So all of this makes the project proposition a very risky one to investors simply because the cash flow forecasts cannot be um, made in a predictable way. Um, now, what does this mean for us as the EIB? What does this mean for investors? It means that we need to introduce some instruments and some mechanisms that can bridge this gap, they can, that can mitigate the risk. So one of the ways of doing this, what, what we do at the EIB, is working with the European Commission who provide us with a first loss piece in the transaction so that the EIB's balance sheet is protected when financing these kinds of projects. An example of this is the Energy Demo Projects Finance Facility, which is already up and running, where we actually have already um, been financing energy demonstration projects. These types of projects where new technologies are for the first time developed at a large scale and that would typically struggle to um, secure, um, secure regular funding. Um, another facility that we also already have is the Future Mobility Facility, which is very dedicated to transport, innovative, clean, green transport, which also is able to finance a lot of hydrogen projects. And maybe later I can talk about what's coming up and what the expectations yeah. are. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And um, Vaitere, I want to come back to you ab about this point because uh, Pauline had talked about the sort of importance of de-risking the process um, as much as possible for the um, in the early stage. How important do you think public support is to bridge the price gap between other kinds of fuels and to help reduce some of the investment risk at the early stage, um, for wh whether we're talking about startups or new technologies? <laughs> yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I mean, I would have to start off by saying that um, we don't need anybody to make our electrolyzers cheap. So we will leverage the cost reductions of our technology. Making cost effective electrolyzers is our mission and it's the reality we are bringing uh, with Enapture. Now, we did mention earlier what is needed uh, to bring down the cost of green hydrogen. And so in order to get started on green hydrogen today, we need instruments that need that help make it attractive. Um, as we heard from Christian, there is a demand for green hydrogen, but it needs to be uh, competitively priced. So in order for green hydrogen to be competitive, then we need to display the fair price of fossil fuels. We need an instrument to cover this market gap of this artificially low price of fossil fuels. So the government needs to intervene in this market uptake, because if it doesn't act now, then who knows how long we need to wait and there's no time to waste. Thank you so very much. Oh, oh, go on. Sorry, just yeah, just I just wanted to wrap up that what's really important here is that the green hydrogen market takes off early because we need to stop burning fossil fuels. And if we pick which eggs we put in what baskets, then we're prioritizing green hydrogen as it's the only one that will fight climate change. Thank you very much. Okay, so listening to that, we have obviously Karina Crastel. Can you tell the audience members who don't know um, about the European excuse me, green hydrogen. Oh gosh, I've forgotten what the acronym stands for already. I apologize for that. Uh, so, uh, Acceleration Center, it was the A. And can you tell the audience a little bit more about it and what its role is in helping to build these partnerships that bring these breakthrough technologies to scale? And also picking up on what both Vaisea and Paulina were sort of talking about. Do you think scaling is possible without public funding? And if so, how? Yeah, so that's a really provocative uh, question because we've been talking a lot about funding. So maybe just to briefly to explain um, what, who we are and what we're doing at the Acceleration Center. So we are a body of the European Union with a mission to accelerate innovation in the energy sector. Um, and for this, we've created the Hydrogen Acceleration Center, the Renewable Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center, because we've seen on the market that uh, there's a real gap here um, when it comes to having ideas of projects and bringing them really 
um, on scale and bringing them to the funding round. So like what Paulina uh, was just explaining, all the risks involved in the hydrogen project, they're really obvious and they don't make the projects bankable. And therefore we saw that there is a need for an entity like ours to, to help um, get them off the ground. So um, what do we do? We act as a minority investor. So we're really taking small uh, minority investments in projects at early stage. Um, and hydro those are industrial hydrogen projects uh, in hard to bait sectors. And um, in doing this, taking a minority share, we help those hydrogen projects de-risk them ex and accelerate their time to market through added value services. And those can be anything that uh, Polina, for example, mentioned, um, you know, getting off-term, stable, long-term off-term pri off-take prices. Um, we try, for example, to help projects um, to get them. And how do we do that? Um, we try to, and there we come to the provocative question, uh, go away from the discussion on the price of hydrogen, but try to focus on a value chain approach. And um, what do I mean by this? And I was really happy to hear what Christian was saying, you know, on the, on the chemical side, that there is really a need for green hydrogen. But what we believe is we need to go one step further and involve other actors even more downstream the value chain in discussions. We have, for example, an example um, of an early investment that we've done, which is called H2 Green Steel, a green steel plant in the north of Sweden, where they have actually involved the end of taker in the venture building approach. So that means they have co-invested together with other financial investors, uh, and private, in the venture to produce green steel. And those are companies like Scania, so an automotive company um, for truck uh, manufacturer, uh, as well as Daimler. And so we believe we really, on the one hand, um, can help uh, companies and projects um, to innovate uh, on the business model as well and how, how projects can be done. And this is just one example. We can also help, um, and that was our, our one of our discussion here, on access to finance. So um, we have uh, initiated a business investment platform uh, where we uh, create a matching between investors and hydrogen projects. And here we engage with investors really early on to identify the downfalls of a project and then work together with them to bring them up to scale. So, um, yeah. Guess, Thank you. Uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Sopna, do you, and Christian, do you want to have a quick comment on what you've heard so far? If there's anything that you'd like to add? Sopna, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. I think I would definitely fully echo what Karina was just was alluding to the topic about building integrated value chains. Because I think when we talk about funding and financing, at the end of the day, we are talking about projects where everything has to simultaneously get developed. The production side, the consumption side, the transport infrastructure side. And yes, we still have moving regulatory and political framework conditions. The only way to make those projects also financeable, bankable at the end of the day is to run this in an integrated way, meaning you need to bring the partners together on board and also then drive the large scale integrated projects because only they will then really sufficiently create the demand. Because I can totally understand also what Christian said in terms of, yes, there needs to be kind of a planability, but nobody can guarantee you today yet, yeah, what the price of hydrogen for the next 15 or 20, even 25 years is going to be. So that's something where we, from a partnership perspective, have to work together. And just maybe coming to another point previously mentioned, um, but I would want to stress it again. It's the topic again about carbon contract for difference. Yes, reality is we do have a cost gap today between green and gray hydrogen. And that's also from a financing perspective, quite of a challenge. However, being really mindful of what it really takes to close the, car, um, the, the gap and saying, if you compare gray with green hydrogen, the cost delta can be compensated. So companies like Maca or are there any other sectors can actually, from an economic perspective, take the business case decision. That's definitely going to be a very helpful instrument. Thank you. Christian, do you want to add anything to that? I actually have an audience question coming up for you as well, but if you'd like to pick up on anything that your co-panelists have said, you're welcome to I now. I think we are every, everybody's pretty, pretty much aligned, I think. Okay, <laughs> no, all right. You know, so I need should, ample entries I in a low price, which is green, which is the answer. Okay, so I shouldn't come to you for a fight then. Okay, all right then. Uh, Vaitea, we have an audience question for you on supporting projects and this is an anonymous question from the audience, but it's to Vitea. On supporting projects, we have regulations being negotiated at EU level, such as the Trans-European Energy Networks Regulation, which only focuses on high threshold electrolyzers to be, uh, to be support, hang on, which only focuses on high threshold electrolyzers of 50 to 100 megawatts to be supported. Would such an approach shrink the market to the big players only? 
sorry, the question had a question mark in it somewhere which wasn't there. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, I have to say our approach is, is so different that it, it's it's not even something that actually crosses my mind because our focus is on making modular standardized electrolyzers. So actually, I think this is addressing only um, how other electrolyzer manufacturers are approaching uh, the green hydrogen market. But I think this is one way of seeing it, but actually we're seeing that there's another way and it's making standardized modular blocks that can stack uh, according to your hydrogen requirements. So um, I, I think it's a question of, of, uh, of technologies and cost advantage. And here, uh, this is our approach by making a standardized electrolyzer. Thank you. And question for Christian now. This comes from uh, Peter Swetman. Christian, what about the EU ETS Innovation Fund? There are many billions there and it's structured like a carbon CCFD, so carbon contract for difference, mm -hmm. with even more generous terms. So he wants to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, you know, all, all measures in place which help support both the CAPEX side, which we discussed here in the panel, but also very much the OPEX side which is closely related to the electricity pricing for these projects um, is, is absolutely necessary and needed. And, and to hear that there might be, you know, funds available that, that are easier to access or, you know, better to implement, I highly welcome, highly welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, Paulina, I want to come back to you now because you talked, uh, you mentioned earlier that you've got some stuff coming up. Um, what other instruments do you expect to be made available in the next few months from the EIB perspective? Um, so basically the way that the EU financing framework works is that we we are working on um, cycles and, and we have um, basically budgets, which we are now waiting for details of the new European budget um, called Invest EU, which will set the framework for what instruments are available in the next 10 years. So what I can already say is that indeed this new budget invest you it includes hydrogen as a priority and there's already a 15 billion window specifically dedicated to hydrogen within the strategic European investment window and hydrogen is also listed as one of the teams of the key priorities in the green deal recovery package so it's quite clear from from a policy perspective that financing will be available um, now, at the EIB, as of today, we are working with the two instruments I mentioned. So it's the energy demonstration facility and um, the future mobility facility. We also are able to provide um, various types of project finance. What we would hope is that within this new framework, we will again be able to benefit from basically risk um, guarantees coming from the European Commission that would enable the European Investment Bank to finance those types of projects, those large scale projects I was mentioning before, which come with a lot of risks that, that commercial banks are not really able to mitigate as of today, so that the EIB can is able to do it um, with, with, with less risk. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Sopna, Vaitseya, Christian, do you want to react to that? I think, um, I mean, what Paulina just said, I think it's very much welcome if there are new facilities being issued. Um, but I think if I just maybe reflect a little bit of what we all talked about, I think there is something like a consensus about it has to be kind of a large scale approach. It has to happen quickly. Yeah, we can't think only one element or the other. It has to be integrated. And yes, instruments such as the funding programs by the European Commission or funding programs which are maybe on nation state level are helpful, but we need to bring everything together. Yeah, so I mm -hmm. think it's either or point here anyways. Mm -hmm. And on that point about bringing everything together, Karina, uh, do you want to come in on this point? And also, I have a question which has came up, you know, very strongly throughout, in fact, the earlier sessions, which is how do you see Europe's first movers on renewable hydrogen? keeping their competitive advantage like what will help them to do that so that we don't as i think it was as ignacio galan said don't become the next photovoltaic industry where we lose the edge to other parts of the world who can scale and build this industry faster yeah i was just thank you laura i was just uh, going to refer to him to ignacio that uh, actually you know he mentioned uh, speed speed and speed again mm -hmm. so i think um, that is key and that we've heard also from our discussion here is that we need to move fast uh, knowing that other, let's say, key geographies are also moving. Um, and um, there I see, let's say, apart from uh, 
from speed, I see uh, four main levers. So the, the first one would be really a clear regulatory framework. And I think that is, let's say, putting out the base, the political ambition, but also the base of, for example, how do we define green hydrogen? What are the subsidy schemes in place? Uh, how do we accelerate permitting, uh, co-location, yes or no, between hydrogen or uh, and renewable resources? So there's a lot of uh, questions out there that are still framing, let's say, the, the project development. Um, so getting the regulatory framework right uh, and that as quickly as possible, knowing that the Fit for 55 uh, is a really ambitious um, project, yeah. Can, can, no, I'm actually, well, no, this is just, I'm going to come back to all of you in a moment because once one of the things that's come up is speed and as quickly as possible. And I'm just going to, you can finish what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask everybody what as quickly as possible means, you know, realistically, given that you're probably all saying 10 minutes ago or yesterday. But what I'm going to ask those of you who are in the industry to actually come back on that point about what we're talking about when it comes to speed. But Karina, please finish. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, so speed, um, for me, it's four levers. So it would be regulation uh, going fast there. But then we also have like uh, adopting um, an e European ecosystem thinking and value chain thinking, because I think if we solely rely on subsidies to foster hydrogen projects, we will have a few lighthouse projects, but we will wait for them to go through. We will wait for subsidies to go through. So therefore really building this value chain thinking and bringing a market pull to projects, including the end of takers. So the products we want to decarbonize is really key, I think, um, to get scale and also volume of projects. And then also manage complexity. I think, um, uh, as Sapna also said earlier, we need to do a lot of things in parallel. And uh, there I'm talking, just to give you a few examples, we need to build out, let's say, the infrastructure, the technology scale up. Uh, we need to uh, scale up renewables in parallel. We need to adapt industrial processes. We need to do sector coupling uh, that comes along. We need to fix the chicken and egg problem. So there is a lot of questions we need to address and we need to do that in parallel. So there is a lot of complexity there and we need to move fast in that. And then last but not least, um, I think uh, from the investment community, I think I hear that more and more from discussions with uh, investors, public or private, we need to be involved really early on in the projects and take more risks um, in order to overcome those uh, risks that Polina mentioned and work together with the uh, project holders to, to build out the projects really that they can be bankable in the end. Thank you. Okay, so now back to my possible question, probably about speed, the sort of timeframes that we're talking about. Christian, what timeframes are we talking about? I appreciate as quickly as possible, but to meet these targets by 2030, what time frame are we talking about to sort of get this investment unlocked? We, we, have, we have not a single day to lose. That, that is my opinion, and I fully agree with Karina. Speed is really of the essence. And we see other countries like China, they might still have a target which is below ours, behind ours, but I tell you, with the experience we have of China, they will really speed up and they might overtake us on, on, on the left lane, uh, talking continental traffic. Um, well, we really need to be fast. And I think what's essential is that the EU imposes now a master plan for a massive buildup of the renewables. And it's not mm -hmm. about 10% more electricity, 20% more in 10 years. It's about doubling or tripling it. And, Therefore, we need the master plan, we need the grids, and we mm -hmm. need to come to action. Well, there was the point that was made in the previous sessions that the planning permits are the big problem as well when it comes to renewables, and that is a member state issue. So how would, you know, let's, I know we're talking specifically about investment, but we can't really have an EU master plan on renewables if building them, you know, is getting the permits is a problem. What would you yeah, suggest then there? We need, then we need to change the legislation. To, okay. To, to, per, to allow permitting within within six uh, six weeks and not six years. Six weeks and not six years. Okay, but that needs to happen at a national level, right? Wherever it needs to happen. It, it okay. Happen. All right. Okay. Vaitseya and Sopna, very quickly on the speed point, or do you, if you don't have anything different to add, then you don't need to come in. Do you have anything that you would add differently? Yeah, I mean, let's be concrete in terms of speed. I mean, we, for instance, are really very much looking for taking the first investment decision um, early next year. If the right regulatory and political framework conditions are in place, and this would mean to have one of the first really large scale projects of 100 megawatt being online in 2024. So by the mm -hmm. mid 20s, and yes, it's not lose a single day, but by the mid 20s, it's realistic. But only if there is pragmatism and pragmatism means to again use the full potential yes to simplify to simplify permitting um definitely shortening today we need up to seven ten years for offshore wind development i mean that is just not competitive on a world basis other markets will do it much faster and mm -hmm. to 
Laura, I think the why is speed so important. I don't see it as a liability being pioneers here. I think it's a great opportunity for Europe. And especially also because we now have the time frame within if I pick Germany for the next maximum two years to really simplify bureaucracy and to keep the industry. If we don't keep the industry, Europe won't have any production base, we'll lose local jobs, and then we're in a very different economic situation. So I think there is no alternative to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not about penalizing and having pioneering costs, it's about just making it happen. Thank you very yeah. much. Vitea? Sure. Yeah, I'm jumping in. I, I can only agree to that. I mean, what speed means to us is starting the construction of a mass production site uh, two weeks ago and having it live end of 2022, where we're mass producing hundreds and thousands of electrolyzers. That's speed for us. Thank you very much. OK, one more audience questions just come in. I'm going to put this to Christian first and then Karina, if there's time. Uh, Christian, should policy, whether new regulations or funding support, be focused on spur spurring supply or demand? as a first priority or do you think it's a binary choice could you repeat that last one I didn't yes know. so the question from the audience is should policy whether through new regulations or funding support be focused on spurring supply or demand so which should come first i think you know what we said in the beginning also i think it's not a it's not a it's not a problem of the demand the demand is already there so um from that perspective clear it answer. should be about the supply yeah, yeah. okay yes. great all right then karina that was lovely karina is there anything that you want to add or would I you think agree demand is I, I would just say to christian demand is there uh, but at a cost competitive price and that's where the problem is huh? so therefore the question is either uh, we incentivize uh, supply in order to reduce costs of production or we incentivize the downstream demand to uh, take up a premium and I would be rather pro for the second one to really create a market pull and not a technology push. Okay, market pull, not technology push. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're heading into our final wrap up round now, which is the sort of quick fire round again. So 15 seconds or less, we sort of one concrete recommendation that would bring us one step closer to sorting out the finance and investment aspects of the renewable hydrogen market so that we can actually build the industry in Europe in the in the time frame that is being talked about. So Vitea, one practical recommendation. Demand high prices for fossil fuel consumption. OK, so j just make fossil fuels really unattractive. Yep. OK, brilliant. It's artificially low. <laughs> yeah. OK. All right, Sopna. I would say a short term introduction of demand side incentives, quotas or carbon CFDs and mm -hmm. At the same time, designated offshore wind combined with electrolysis areas so that the Austrian production side can actually roll into the market. Okay, thank you. Christian? Uh, well, next to uh, ample amount of green electricity at a low price and the tool which we think would be really helpful is CFDs for that. CFDs, brilliant. Thank you. Karina? Uh, fostering a value chain uh, thinking going down all to the, all the way to the end of taker in hydrogen projects thank, and thank then you. all of what I said before. Thank you very much. Now, obviously, Paulina, you're in a slightly different position here, but if you have a final thought, please do uh, let us know what you think should be happening concretely next. As a banker, all I can say, de-risk financing and enable also commercial banks to finance those large projects, the scale that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation. I'm sure there's a lot more that can be talked about afterwards and in the weeks to come. Stay with us if you're in the audience. Um, we're going to take a short break now, another 10 minutes. And at five past the hour, it's we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation between an electrolysis, between Sunfire and uh, DG Grow at the European Commission to talk about how to build the market in a way that is sustainable for the electrolysis industry. So. Thank you all very much and stay tuned.
Imagine the world before petroleum and electricity, horses with carriages and candles after dark. No one could foresee the reality that we today take for granted, a world transformed by fossil solutions in just a few centuries. We believe it will be the same with hydrogen, the simplest and most abundant element in the universe. Three quarters of the sun is made from hydrogen, providing us with all the clean energy we need for at least five billion more years. Realizing that we have unlimited access to energy from the sun raises an interesting question. How do we manage to make use of it, especially when the energy that hits the earth has an irregular nature? For storing and shifting large amounts of renewable energy in place and time, hydrogen represents the cleanest and most flexible solution. With cost of renewables falling dramatically, hydrogen is already outcompeting fossil fuels several places in the world. With our technology, we make sure that the energy from the sun is not wasted and ensure stable delivery of clean hydrogen and energy anywhere to anyone. Already in 1927, we initiated our electrolyzer activities in Norway. Since then, we have installed several of the largest hydrogen plants in history, continuously improving our technology. Today, we deliver the most reliable and efficient electrolyzers in the market, according to customer requirements, or as containerized turnkey solutions. We also deliver the most compact and flexible hydrogen fueling stations in the world, offering customers fast, convenient fueling for the same long range as conventional vehicles. Eventually, all types of vehicles will be fueled by hydrogen. Combining our expertise on renewable hydrogen production and fueling technology, we enable advanced hydrogen solutions. We are helping governments and businesses all over the world to utilize hydrogen as a cleaner and more economical alternative than fossil sources provide. Transitioning from a fossil to a renewable-based economy is an enormous challenge. The good news is that we already have the technology and resources to replace the old. It's just a matter of time.